welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Welcome to episode 216 of the Industry Angel. Great to have you back with us today. And we thought we'd bring you a discussion that I had recently around the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme kind of coming to an end and maybe what the plans are for maybe you as an employee or as an employer. So we're going to cover both sides with today's guests. We've got two wonderful ladies from the Educational Development Trust. Shall I bring them in? Shall we bring them in? Yes, let's bring them in. Now, Amy has been drafted in this morning, last minute, right? She quickly ran and she's done her hair. She's beautiful. <coughs> she's got changed, the light and everything. Amy, thank you so much for joining us this morning at last minute. Oh, you're welcome, Ian. No problem. <laughs> and we've got your colleague, Madeline, as well. Madeline, good morning. Good morning. You're right, Ian. I'm, I'm good. It's Friday. I'm feeling good. Excited. Excited for the weekend. Good. So now let me, oh, what we've got here, there's Invest South Hindsight. So we can do things like this. Look, we can throw our comments on screen. Yes, Julie um, couldn't make it this morning, hence uh, Amy coming in. So Julie, thank you for your time yesterday. We had a, a quick debrief before and she missed out. So Amy, you're the lucky one. I am, um, <laughs> Morning, Mark. Nice of you to join us once again. Mark's a good supporter of these sessions and uh, I know he takes a lot from them. Now then, Madeline, Educational Development Trust, tell us all about it. So um, it's a big organisation, it's a global organisation and we are a not-for-profit company designed really to improve education and look at how we can transform lives across the world. So it's quite a diverse uh, bit of work that we do. Um, so that includes things like improving school systems, educational research, policy recommendations, but also we manage a portfolio of careers and employability um, programmes. So in the northeast specifically that includes the national career service which amy will talk about and northeast ambition which is uh what i'm here for today wonderful stuff so madeline you mentioned you're on the northeast ambition contract and that are we saying that's from an employer's point of view today yeah so that's more from um how we can link employers with education to help the future talent pipeline if you like uh, but also how we can support employers to access some of the skills programs that are out there at the minute future talent pipeline bit of jargon for you on a friday Loving morning that. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what then amy why don't you give us a quick overview of the national career service and then what i might do is we might pop you out you can get a coffee and and relax a little bit and yep. then maybe Madeline to take us through her side. So quick overview of the National Career Services. Yeah, certainly. So the National Career Service is pretty much a, it, it do as it says on the, on the tin service, really. We do advice and guidance for anybody over the age of, sort of the contract I'm on, anybody over the age of 18, right up to when they decide that they no longer need the careers guidance anymore. And that can be simply supporting a customer with a CV, or it can be supporting them with something a little bit more complex, like uh, a midlife career review, support them to understand their transferable skills, which I think is probably one of the most important things we're doing at the moment, to help them prepare for interviews. And it's all about sort of moving them through a journey, supporting them through a journey from where they are now, wherever that may be, right up to wherever they want to go. So there's no sort of prescription for our customers we will support them with whatever skills whatever support they need to help them move through that career journey so what i heard there amy there's no age limit on this no no upper age limit uh, like i say we we do support school leavers but that's mm -hmm. a, um, a different side to what i do we work with anybody from the age of 18 right up to to when they decide that um work is no longer for them so. I'm never retiring, by the way, Amy, so you'll be seeing me. I'll be rocking up at <laughs> we'll, 95. We'll, we'll see you, um, you know, with your walking stick. <laughs> I'm not having walking sticks. I'll have, I'll have a bionic body by then, man. So, oh, is this one of your colleagues here? It oh. is, yes. It is. Go. Aristea. Hi, Aristea. Aristea, feeling the love for you today. Good. Amy, is that fully funded? Yes. 
It is, yes. It's a, um, it's a no-cost service. Customers can come to us at any time. They can use us once. They can use us 10, 20 times, however many times they need that support. Wonderful. So, Amy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you off the hook for a little bit. I can relax. Thank you very much. <laughs> you Thanks can relax. Oh, well, look, there's, there's Mark saying, I think he needs an appointment. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, wonderful Look forward stuff. to seeing you, Mark. <laughs> right, Amy, off you go. You relax. Madeline. Hello. Hello. Over to you then. So you talk, you initially talked about the Northeast Ambition Project. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, all these, I'm going to have to get used to all these jargon and names and acronyms and things because there's a lot going on. So in, in terms of what I'd love you to do is give us it straight, myth busting, no jargon, plain English, because I'm not, you need to be really, honestly, dumb it down for me. It's Friday and I'm, <laughs> it's early. So give us it all about the Northeast Ambition Project and what that could mean to employers. And obviously we're talking about furlough here in the job retention scheme. So what does that mean? So the Northeast Ambition Project is, um, it's in partnership with the Northeast LEP, who I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. And they originally ran a pilot scheme, which was more around linking employers with the education system. So helping young people to understand what the world of work really looks like. So rather than just that curriculum subject, what does it look like for young people coming out to employers? And how do we help them to make those career choices at a younger age and all the way through? And then we have got funding to work in partnership with the North East LEP through the ESF, and that is until September 2023, which feels a long time away, but I feel like it might disappear quickly. And that expansion of the project is where Education Development Trust have come in to support small to medium-sized enterprises in how they can best look at their own skills in the business. So by doing things like a learning and skills needs analysis with them, um, looking at any skills gaps they've got in the business, particularly as a result of the pandemic, you know, people have been on furlough, they might come back and need some extra support with getting themselves upskilled and digital skills, for example. So we can support them to look at their existing employees, but also there are people coming out of the pandemic who want to grow the business still and there's a lot of government programs out there so apprenticeships traineeships the kickstart program and it's confusing for people so the northeast ambition project's main role is to help those businesses to identify the best option for them and we kind of take the work out of all that confusion and help them find the way through that system well no pressure then so <laughs> and, and i imagine you know I totally imagine that it might have been quiet maybe when when the pandemic first hit for you guys and then it started to yeah well so we started in uh, january so it's still fairly new january and, of 21 yeah of 21 okay. yeah so that was when the expansion really started mm -hmm. to work with those that support for employers and we weren't planning on working virtually you know our plan was to physically be going out and meeting employers and going to networking and events and hosting sessions and so for the team actually we've had to change the way that we approach employers as much as the employers who are out there working on, on the ground so for me you know it's taken a bit of a different strategy to try and get the word out there around businesses you know it's a fully funded program but a lot of employers are just worried about you know what's happening with furlough just keeping the the business going at the minute so we totally understand that but it has looked a little bit different than what we maybe planned originally but hopefully going forward we will be able to do more of the physical appointments and and sessions as well i've i've got some stats here that, that our lindsay from uh, the business invest team gave us and i'm, and I'm going to talk through some of them. 11% of our workforce in South Tyneside are on furlough, and that's down from March, which was 13. And the peak in June 2020 was 31%. So that's nine, like over 19,000 of our workforce in South Tyneside. So obviously, as things unlock and people are coming off the furlough scheme, I guess our resident debt right today, the, the, the whole why we're here is to help employers navigate through the, these waters so what, what can they do just reach out madeline to yourselves and, and is it is it fully funded would you just come in is there a consultant comes in and spends time how does it work 
So we have a team of skills facilitators. Um, That's a jargony title, isn't it? But um, (laughs) their job is to work with that business really closely, build an understanding of the business, conduct a bit of an analysis of where they're at at the moment and what the plans are for the future, and then specifically look at what skills options might be the best for them. So a lot of businesses and a lot of especially small businesses don't really know that they can put their current employees onto an apprenticeship, for example, and tap into that kind of funding stream. And we know that that helps to retain staff for the future as well. That embedded CPD option for people makes them feel like they want to be loyal to the organisation. And so it could be that we look at that kind of thing for them. But also, you know, Amy touched on earlier, we might work um, on the Northeast Ambition Programme, we might work on the organisational level. So we do a skills analysis, we look at what the business, the overall overarching themes are for that business for the next few years. In terms of individuals, if there's people in that business who would like a career review or would like to have those conversations about what does their future look like in that business, what training do they need, then that might be where National Career Service could come in as well. So there is a lot of cross work and that that goes on here. So our skills facilitators would then look at what is the best solution for that employer and either signpost some individual employees to National Career Service if needed, but continue working with that employer until they have you know, got to the end of that journey, if you like, of what was the options for them for skills. So if they're going to take somebody on Kickstart, our job is to provide that impartial guidance around the best way to do that how do you do it how do you get the application form in what does the incentive payments look like and almost do an end-to-end process with that business i want to pick up two things he's touched upon apprentices and he touched upon kickstarter so we can let's look at the number ones something i was really surprised that what you said was a current employee you can put them on an apprenticeship is that right and, absolutely and, and obviously leverage the, the the levies that are there and then the incentives so so I'm a 40-year-old guy, I'm on X amount of money, I've been here for 10, 10 years, I suddenly go on an apprenticeship, but my wages don't change and my job title doesn't change, but I get to do some extra qualification and the business leverages the incentives? Absolutely. So there's different you know, rules and regulations depending on the mm-hmm. business, and that would be something our skills facilitators would have the, the conversation about because it depends on whether they're a levy payer or not. Generally, the businesses we're working with are quite small, um, so it's about looking at what is the best pot of money for them. So there's sometimes some contribution towards an apprenticeship, but you know, often it's it's highly um, funded through the government, so it's not huge amounts of money. And you know, somebody can do a degree level apprenticeship now and doesn't have to be on a minimum wage. You know, it could be mm. that they stay on their salary, they get qualifications and it helps that business grow for the future and plan, you know, because if you can tie in an apprenticeship that's going to support the business as well as the employee, then that makes business sense. I'm stunned. I did not know that was a thing. And I'm also stunned that when I said I was 40, you laughed. But, um... <laughs> just, just, it was a surprise. It was a surprise. <laughs> Let, let's look at the Kickstarter thing then, because I, I think that's relatively new and people might not know it. And this is all about education today. So tell us a little bit about that, what that scheme is all about. So that's designed, government a government scheme that's designed for young people um, to help give them some real work experience. It's really hard for young people out there at the minute to get any work experience. So the government have put a programme together where the employer can get a fully funded placement for 25 hours a week on national minimum wage. They can employ them for longer than that if they want and pay the extra. But in terms of how much is funded for that young person's placement, it's 25 hours a week. There is some incentives there as well, depending on the process that the employer goes through and if they go directly to DWP to apply for that or whether they use um, what's called a gateway provider. There is elements where the provider will support that young person with employability training. So there's a little bit of that incentive money that might be pulled towards that support. But the key around Kickstart is that it's not just and it's for six months, um, the placement, but it's not just about getting somebody in to make the teas and coffees. It's, you know, a genuine, valuable work placement, but that's going to support the business, but that also has some elements of training for that young person around employability skills, CVs, interviews, so that hopefully it helps them take that next step. But they could actually as well do a kickstart placement and then go on to an apprenticeship. So if that employer Mm -hmm. thinks that young person actually is really good, we want to keep them in the business, then there's progression onto the next steps as well for them if that's what they would like to do. 
Have you got any stories you can tell us, Madeline? I don't know if it's a confidentiality thing. I'll put you on the spot here. But anything around, you know, people coming from, you know, maybe long-term unemployment into Kickstarters, anything you could share? Any case well, we're, we're still in our infancy, really. Mm-hmm. And what's what's been a bit of a challenge is the time scales are a little bit difficult. You know, we know that these programmes, we want it to happen immediately, but we're just starting to get those young people. Um, so we started in sort of January, so it was probably February, March, when we started engaging with employers. And we've just started getting those kickstart placements filled. So we're working with the DWP to look at how you match that young person to that role, who's best for that position. So yeah, we're just, we're starting to just get those through the door now but hopefully if I can come back in a, in a couple of months we'll give you some of those case studies as well <laughs> I'd love that that'd be brilliant let's look at that job retention scheme then and I, I touched upon it at, at the top of the conversation there where I said it'd been extended many times by the, the chancellor and how's that been what what's the thoughts what what have employers what hurdles have they been through how is the general feel are they, are they a bit confused what's the temperature of the landscape right now I think like all of us, everyone's confused at the minute, you know, and it's our job to look at skills and solutions for businesses, but it is a bit of a minefield out there. And, you know, as an example, hospitality, you know, it's it's in the news a lot this last few weeks because we've got the 21st of June as a deadline, but there are still question marks around that. And for the, for those employers, it's really trying to identify how do they get back some of the talent that they've lost? Because a lot of those people who went on furlough or saw the pandemic was going to last for a longer time, then retrained and went into longer term careers. And that's great for them. They've, they've actually moved forward. But what that's meant is that actually the hospitality sector and, and retail and things haven't actually got as many people to go back in the, you know full capacity at the point that we'd like to. So you know, we know there are massive benefits around the retention schemes and around furlough, and it's it's secured a lot of businesses. But I think the blurry lines about what it's going to look like in the coming months are still causing issues for some businesses. What we're finding is that some businesses that we engage with are absolutely on board, want to grow their business, want to upskill their existing staff. But also there are some businesses that just are worrying about the next few days. So, you know, we are here until September 2023, so we, we will reconnect with those businesses that we've spoken to as well further down the line when, you know, things hopefully have settled a little more. How about our, our self-employed then, Madeline? I don't know if this is you or, or whether this is Amy or whether it blurs, I, I really don't know. But I think we've, I think it's 30 million, I can tell you. Yeah, 30, over 30 million pounds worth of support for our self-employed in the borough. How, how does that look? I won't get on my soapbox, but it has been a little bit confusing for our self-employed, you know, our beauticians, tax drivers, hairdressers, PTs, whatever. I I think they have had a bit of a a raw deal. So how do you find in that when you're speaking to these people? Yeah, I mean, we can still work with, you know, self-employed and micro businesses as well. Mm -hmm. And there are options out there for them. And what I would say is that our team are experts in skills. So what the business looks like in terms of retaining talent, using jargon again, um, attracting people into the business and what skill solutions. But because we're working closely with the Northeast LEP as well, you know, we're not experts in business as a whole, but what we can do is help refer and signpost into other growth organisations and restart grants and, um, you know, potential different pots of money that are out there to support those businesses. It's a challenge because as much as it's complicated for businesses, you know, we are, we take a lot of time to do that research for that business. And, I suppose that's the nice thing about our um, this Northeast Ambition project is that we only have small caseloads of employers so that we can really spend the time to look at what's needed for that business. And if it's something that we can't help with, we can find someone who can help them with that, hopefully as well. I, I think that that's where the value is, because I think sometimes... I mean, even friends of mine have been like, I, you know, I just, I just don't know what's going on. I don't know where to turn. I, I don't know what's coming. And I know the hospitality sector is right in this zone right now of a bit of insecurity. They know that they don't know what's coming and there's events planned and is it going to come off and, and that sort of stuff. So I think if you can put the legwork in for people and do research, that that is invaluable because I think some people are, are literally, at the end of the tether, it's been a bit of a tough tough ride for us all. So it's lovely that you've got that service there. And is there a limit, Madeline, in terms of how many hours you can spend or helping people? No, I mean, what happens is that skills facilitator will have some really in-depth conversations at the start of working with that employer to identify a few project aims. So what is it that that employer would like to get out of working with us? 
what then happens is we will work with that employer until those aims are complete and that might be you know they might want to take a kickstart person on and that might be the only aim but actually they might also want some signposting for some business mentoring or you know how where are the business to business networks at the minute where can they support each other is there a fund out there that helps restart grants for COVID and things like that so we will work with them as much or as little as they as they want to really. And it is just about us taking the work out of it a little bit. But also, we are impartial. And I think it's the, one of the keys of this project is about educating the employers so that in the future, they'll be able to find their own way around this because it is confusing. So it's that, you know, we're here to support now. But hopefully what that means in the future is that those businesses, if they want an apprentice, they'll know exactly how to do that in the future. And then we can move on to helping other businesses as well. I think the interesting bit about this is that you don't have the answers maybe right now, but you, you'll go away and find them out. And actually, the answer you've got today might be a different answer yeah. next week. So, you know, that the benefit of you is you can put the legwork in and, and take the time to do the research and ask the questions. And you'll probably have really good networks. And like you say, being able to signpost people, I, I love that support. And you know, the whole reason we're here today is, and, and the, the whole council's focus with putting this on today and interacting with you is to highlight that as well, to let people know that it's there. So how, how do you do that, Madeline? How do you market or network? It's hard right now. How do you get out there and, and, and shout from the rooftops about the fact that you're there to help? Um, so we've got uh, a website, which we would encourage everybody to have a look at. It's got some um, really inf useful information on there about the current labour market. So, you know, we're very lucky. We've got a, a big team of people who can support us to look at the labour market in the northeast. What does that look like? What are the growth plans? It does have some information about the programme and it has a contact us section on there. But also we are really you know, we're trying to use social media in the best way. You will see the skills facilitators at a lot of um, cluster groups, chamber of commerce, you know, we are linking with the council. So, you know, it's not probably our strategy that we would have planned if we'd had a normal working environment, but everything at the minute is online, but we are getting back to a bit of a normal way of working. So we are starting to make those physical meetings if that's what an employer wants. Because what's been interesting is actually, although we've started virtually and weren't planning on it, a lot of employers like that because it doesn't yeah. take a huge amount of time. We don't have to travel. You know, it means that we can have that conversation still face to face, but, you know, through virtual means. So, yeah, it's, it's I'll still like that face to face and I still think there's definitely a need for it. Um, and we're looking forward to it. But we've been definitely all over the social media platforms. <laughs> Wonderful. Is it the Educational Development Trust website? Yes, there's a link. I think I shared it. Yeah, that's the one. It's got the Northeast I'm Ambition on it. I'm name. on it. <laughs> I'm impressed. So all our social media uh, links are on there as well if people want to follow us. We are really interested in just connecting with businesses. It's fully funded. So, you know, let us know if you're interested and we can certainly meet with people and just have a chat with them. It might not be for them. It might not be for them now, but it might be in the future. But also because of that link with the Northeast Lab, if somebody wants to engage with young people and help talk, you know, we've got a few companies who, you know, are really interested in that corporate social responsibility and helping the next generation. So we can link with them and get them to look at working in schools and support with that curriculum development as well. Wonderful stuff. Right across the Northeast Madeline, is it? or? So it's the Northeast LEP region. The will, there is an equivalent in, if we've got anybody on here, who might be in Tees Valley area. So we can refer across to the equivalent contract that's outside of those Northeast LEP boundaries if needed. Wonderful stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Do you think we should bring our friend Amy in? She's had enough coffee, hasn't she? <laughs> well, I, I think you need a glass of water as well. Come on, let, let's bring Amy in. Hi, Amy. Hello. How was that? It was good, wasn't it? She does wasn't a it? good job. She knows her stuff, doesn't she? Are you impressed there? Eh? I certainly am. <laughs> let's tell you what, let, let's, get, let's have Madeline for a cup of coffee and then we'll bring her back in later. Thanks, Madeline. No problem. So that, that was good, Amy. So what we've heard there is we've heard a lot about the support that's there for um, businesses in the Northeast Lep region, which is fantastic. And obviously, Madeline touched upon various things such as apprenticeships and the Kickstarter and job retention, that kind of thing. Your side is National Career Service. Yep. Tell us all about it. Yep. So, <laughs> like I said before, the National Career Service is an advice and guidance service. So for anybody at any stage in their career, they may be in work, they may be unemployed currently, they may be on furlough and considering their options. 
And like I said earlier, that can be anything from a whole career review with them because they are looking at, you know, moving out of one sector and into another to sort of safeguard their future career. Or it could be they've got an interview coming up and they want some guidance around that. Or can we review their CV to make sure that the jobs they're applying for are relevant to their skills? And the customers um, can come to us once, twice, 10 times, 20 times if that's what they need. We support the customer to make their own decisions. We never profess to make the decisions for them or we never profess to say we are going to give you this guidance and this is what you've got to follow. It's all about giving the customers that confidence to take ownership and have Mm -hmm. the confidence in moving forward in their own career goals. That's great. To do that, you must have lots of experts and Amy in the project then to sort of look at how CVs are structured or how interview techniques and that sort of see if you've got a if you've got a pool of experts there? We all, uh, I wouldn't say profess to be experts. We all have a lot of knowledge around your CVs, your interview skills. But we draw on other members of the team because we all come from different walks of life. You know, for example, I was an employment advisor before this and then before that I worked in a call centre and I've also sort of done a little bit of hairdressing many, many years ago. You know, we've had police officers, teachers. We've got a lot of sort of people from different walks of life that we can draw on their expertise. So we do use the team, the wide team for a lot of guidance as well. So if we don't know the answers that, you know, we will say you know, we'll, we'll use somebody else within the team, quick email, and then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be able to get that guidance. You're an expert, Amy, come on, own it. <laughs> well, I'll take that, I'll take that. <laughs> <Even the> callers. <laughs> I asked Madeline earlier on about case studies and stories, because, you know, we all learn from stories and I love, to, I love to wrap a story up because it just helps it sit in my brain. But I think the project had just recently been in, in its infancy, like January 21. What, what about you, Amy? Have you got anything you could share about stories that you could, I don't know if there's any confidentiality issues, but it just helps shape maybe some of the support you can give? Yeah, certainly. One instantly springs to mind and I use this example with a session that I did um, with a job centre just the other day. I had a customer um, came to me who was absolutely adamant. She had no skills whatsoever. She'd been unemployed for a little while, you know, through a a bereavement in the family. She'd done a little bit of voluntary work, but not a great deal. And she was so low on confidence. I've got no skills. We're never, ever going to be able to do this CV. I've just got nothing to go on it. We did something called um, what, what is commonly known to us as a careers guidance session, but some will know it as a skills health check. And that's just asking a series of questions. And she didn't even realise what I was doing was this careers guidance session. I was just having a chat to her, talking about what she'd done in the past. And she sort of left that session so much more confident. We had a further session where we created a CV and she was so shocked and surprised that we'd been able to build this document with so much on it. She was offered interviews. We worked on interview preparation with her. And I got a text message yesterday to say she had been offered a position as a support worker, which is what her, her dream was sort of since having the bereavement in the family and sort of gaining that guidance herself. So it was it just it made my day. We, we all say that sort of getting those text messages, getting those phone calls is, mm. is what we do the job for. But she was she was just so happy with the fact that she'd sort of gained that guidance and then moved through that those steps ourselves. Thanks for sharing that. Amy. That made me smile as well. And, <laughs> and, and it, it's often the case, you know, sometimes when you verbalize with someone else what you do, you know, in your head, you think, actually, oh, I'm rubbish. I've got no skills. And then you literally, you're, ta- you're starting to regurgitate all the things you've done. You're exactly. Like, and then exactly. you, you then you're, you're obviously record that and just go, there you go. And like, oh, yeah. I didn't realize I'd done that. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I think we do that ourselves, don't we? I mean, yeah, if somebody yeah. sits down and asks you, what do you do? For a living, I'm a careers advisor. What does that mean? I've got to start thinking about it. And for somebody who's never had to think about that, you know, particularly for somebody who's maybe on furlough now, who's been employed for for quite a while, if they've never really had to think about that because they've just been comfortable in that job, it then becomes quite a scary concept to start considering so what do those skills mean? And, you know, I, I know I've got these skills or I don't know I've got these skills. What can I now do with them? So someone sitting on job retention scheme that might have been on for a number of months, they might be having a feeling of insecurity, like, will I be going back to my position in July or whenever? But they could reach out to you and you could just say, look, you know, there might be July might come and everything might go back to where it was. Or let's have a chat and maybe we could just, you know, throw something around and, and see. Yeah. 
Yeah, certainly. And I would say to anybody who's on furlough, prepare, um, you know, start okay. thinking about what are our what ifs and what does that look like for you? So the ideal scenario would be, you know, furlough ends, you return back to your role and everything's absolutely fine. But have a contingency plan, um, you know, come and speak to a careers advisor and find out what your options are, find out where your transferable skills lie and how they could move forward. But also for those people who maybe are now thinking about what their career might look like in sort of five, six months time, or you know, even further than that, thinking about, oh, I've been in this career for quite some time. And quite a lot of people are now reconsidering you know, on furlough, right, okay, shall I you now use this time to, to retrain, to, to find out what my skills are, to update my CV, so. It's really interesting because you are, if you are on the furlough scheme, you're going to have a little bit of time on your hands and, and, and why not utilise that time and maybe even just put a CV together. It's, it's remarkable. Sometimes I speak to people and say, like, just send us a CV or a pen portrait or a bio or anything and they don't have these things in the locker and it's, well, why? why? And they've never really needed it, but as you say, let's do it whilst you don't need it in case when you do need it it's just there yeah yeah, yeah. exactly exactly <clears throat> a good old army saying my, i get it from my <clears throat> husband all the time fail and prepare is is preparing to fail and you know and i suppose we can look at that sort of quite objectively <clears throat> can't we and think you know prepare now i think a lot of people you know celebrated the furlough scheme when it first came around you know it was going to be all this free time they were going to have this time off but you know i'm still going to get paid something <laughs> you know it was amazing but then all of a sudden we sort of now starting to think about that furlough scheme coming to an end and people are thinking right okay what if that doesn't happen you know there could be two roads we could go down so certainly come and speak to careers advisor if you gain the guidance we do the appointment and it's not needed that is absolutely fantastic you know, we would rather that happened. But if you need it, you've had that and you're starting to prepare and starting to look forward. Well, there's a wonderful call to action then, you know, prepare now. Yeah. And I, I think your husband's a fan of Yoda. Did Yoda, Yoda not say that? I don't know. He was in, he was a, um, he was a squaddy. So that's where it's come from. I get these names <laughs> all the time. So, he's <laughs> forward. so yeah, that's where he got it from. But Good. Well, um, he's a man after my own heart because, yeah, I think preparation is is the key right now if we've got some time. And we've had a comment there from Leanne and it's a really, really good question. Is there any funding for training courses out there? Um, yeah, depending on what the customers want to do, we can um, source free funding, free courses <clears> for them. So if a customer's just wanting to work on some skills now, there are quite a few online distance learning courses but for anybody who is maybe you know heavens um you know thinking about it but facing redundancy we can support that customer to make applications to something called the rapid response fund which is a fund from the job center that will help them to upskill to move back into work quicker so there are lots of options usually we can support like i say for your level two and now also level three qualifications if a customer hasn't got a level three qualification um government have just sort of brought out that they can apply that there are courses available for level two and level three and then like I say further looking further to the future if redundancy does happen we can support with that funding request from the job centre. In terms of what's happened Amy could you give us a little bit of an overview of how long have you been with the service? I've been with National Career Service for just over five years. Wow is this so five years what what's the last year or so look like in comparison to the other four? Um, so, so different. I mean, I think we were at some point in the next X amount of years going to look at sort of moving towards digital <clears throat> platform. And I think COVID has then just sped that up. Just the same as everybody else, bit of a culture shock for us, sort of setting up desks in our living rooms, in our kitchens, wherever it's may be. And customers then obviously had that shock of, they would usually have been coming to see us in a job centre or a training provider face to face, and that was no longer an option. So just as the customers have had that culture shock, you know, everything's changed for them and they've had to adapt to that very quickly. We've had to do the same. But we have found that some customers have taken to that 
you know, very, very quickly. Some have needed a little bit more guidance. But I think it's or it has opened up opportunities such as these distance learning courses that's available, you know, such as customers, a lot of, a lot more customers can now reach us because, you know, they don't have to leave home. They can do it on telephone. They can mm. do it on Zoom. We can do it on Teams. So we have opened that platform up a little bit more for those customers who maybe wouldn't have felt as comfortable coming into a job centre to speak to us. Specifically, you know, those customers who aren't claiming a job centre benefit, it's quite an alien environment for them to go into. We can now bypass that. So it has opened it up, opened up so many more opportunities for our customers and for us as well. So we've learned so much from this situation. Where, where, where is there a physical location, Amy, to go into? Like what? We normally work out of <clears throat> job centres, so we mm -hmm. are right, in every okay. single, we have an advisor in every single job centre across the North East, um, mm -hmm. South Tyne, North Tyne and Durham areas and Teesside, so we would usually have an advisor in those job centres. We work with a lot of training providers as well, so you can sometimes come and see us um, from there. Um, so that tends to be where we where we would be, but like I say, we're now sitting in corners of living rooms and, you know, bedrooms and things like that. With beautiful halos above your head. Yes, exactly. Like I said, if I sit <laughs> just right, it looks like I'm an angel <laughs> What about anyone's thoughts about confidentiality, Amy? So they might be in a current role now, they may be on furlough and they just want to kind of look at what, what, what's out there. Is everything purely confidential? Employers wouldn't find out they've had a chat with yourselves? Of course not. Like I say, some we have dealt with employees before where we've gone into businesses and had these conversations. But if an individual prefers to come to us, then certainly not. Everything would be confidential, same as it would be, um, you know, if a customer was coming to us from the job centre. If they specifically ask us to keep those conversations confidential, then no, it would just be that one to one appointment and, you know, nobody else need know other than us and the, the, the customer. Wonderful stuff. Thank you so much. For that. Shall, I, shall I bring our Madeline back in? Yes, let's bring her back. Hi. Hello, you're all right. How was that? Did you do well? Absolutely fantastic. Um, Excellent stuff, eh? I'm an ex-careers advisor. I worked on National Careers Service as well. And it is a fantastic contract, you know, and it's it's under underutilised, I think. You know, people don't necessarily know it's around. And especially those who are maybe working at the minute, you know, should be thinking about the future. You know, as a careers advisor, we're not great at doing it ourselves, but I think we're good at advising others. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people think we're just for younger people don't we mm -hmm. do you work in schools mm -hmm. no we're for everybody you know anybody of any age can come to us you know I've had customers come to me you know way past retirement age because it's just not retirement's just not for them but they want to look at their options you know we get people coming to us who are just you know coming into the labour market and you know wanting the guidance because it's just a bit of a minefield so yeah we do we work with everybody Wonderful stuff. I, I really enjoy that. I, I've took so much from that and, and I hope other people <clears throat> will share this as well f for for people to maybe watch on, on catch up when, when they've got some time. Because obviously this is you know, works time. People might be busy, but it's Friday. I'm sure you're all off on a half day. Sun shining out there. Yeah. And, and if the gaffer's watching, you know, pop in the comments if the, if the two ladies can have a half day. Because Amy, you did so well there coming in on short notes. I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. You did. You did so well, thank you. Kind of dropped you in there, but you you are brilliant. Is there anything else you, you, you might want to leave us with? Anything we haven't, maybe I haven't asked you or anything you want to drop in? I think it's, you know, just get in touch. I suppose for, from an education development trust perspective, we've got a number of contracts that can help either employers or individuals, whether they're employed or unemployed. So, you know, if you got in touch with either of myself or Amy or our projects, then we'd be able to, to help signpost you to the right, the right contact, really. Can we connect with you on LinkedIn? Absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. you, you know what's out there now. You're going to get inundated with invites and requests. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm. I'm so pleased we've had you on today, and I know the council were, were, were really thankful that you've came today and uh, and done this. So I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm going to get you going, get some fresh air. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been lovely to meet you. Thank you so much, Amy and Madeline. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, thank Ian. You. Have a good day. And you. Bye bye. Bye. Brilliant stuff. There you go. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I certainly did. I learned a few things there, especially about the um the apprentices as well. You know. A current employee can go on to an apprenticeship and, and, and leverage all those wonderful incentives and, and start looking at qualifications as well. What have you got here? There's our Invest team thanking Amy and Madeline. Yeah, you know, brilliant. And again, thanks to Amy for stepping in as Julie couldn't make it this morning. Let us know how you found, found this. Let us know if you want 
any other information of any way that the Business Invest team here in South Tyneside can help you, drop us a line on obviously the social channels, you know, give us some feedback, let us know if you found it great. Please do share this as well and get the message out there. It's just literally a click of a button and um, no one's give us some love either. There's no, there's a few likes, but no love. So, uh, you know, come on, show us the love. Right then, so I'm gonna let you all go. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you so much for joining us once again and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>